as the left-wing media and political establishment goes mad as Boris Johnson, his wife Carrie, and Rishi Sunak are all hit with partygate fines, we'll analyze what it means for the future of this government with political heavyweights and expert commentators. Plus, should lockdowns really remain on the table, positive professor Carol Sakura weighs in. And I'll debate the top stories of the day with my superstar panel. Former Daily Star editor and current columnist Dawn Neeson, conservative commentator Calvin Robinson, and entrepreneur and author Angelica Mallon. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursday from 9pm till 11pm on GB News. Hello, I'm Michelle Jubery, and you can join me every weekday, 6 till 7 on Jubes and Kerr. Me and my panel will get stuck right into the day's events. And I can tell you, in fact, I can warn you, expect some robust debates and strong opinions and perspectives from both sides of the fence. It's about you at home as well. I love to read out all of your comments, or at least as many as I can. So join me, Michelle Jubery, Monday to Friday, 6 till 7 on Jubes and Kerr. On radio, they call it the drive time slot, 4 p.m. until 6 p.m. as listeners head home. It's that part of the schedule when the dust of the day's events begin to clarify, and we try to make sense of it for you. Brazier is drive time for radio and TV. It's fast, it's punchy, it's opinionated, there's a brazier angle and a little bit of levity. That's the question. That's two questions, actually. <laughs> That's Brazier, Monday to Thursday, 4 till 6 on GB News. Hello, I'm Patrick Christie's. And I'm Mercy Moroki. Make sure that you join us Monday to Thursday, 10am until midday, right here on GB News for To The Point. We're not afraid to talk about the topics that matter to you or the big topics that always matter. We cover absolutely everything from the breaking political stories of the day to law and order, what's going on in the channel. We're not afraid to hold people to account. We always make sure we include your views on our show. Indeed, if you're thinking it, you can guarantee that we're saying it. So make sure you join the conversation with us 10am until midday, Monday to Thursday for To The Point on GB News. I'm Dan Wilson. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV, where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wilson tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Hey, welcome along on tonight's Mark Stein Show, live on your telly and on your wireless, simultaneously or even simultaneously. Leilani Dowding is here to talk about free speech and related matters. Because if you don't have the right to free expression, you can't argue for any of your other rights. Do we have free speech on COVID? Not a lot of it, but we're going to try to pierce the blizzard of lies. And yes, cake gate. Cake gate. The guilty include the Prime Minister, who probably should have stayed in Kiev. It's a lot safer for him there than in London. And the Chancellor of the Exchequer, who's apparently some kind of American chappy, so he's probably fled jurisdiction uh, by now. Plus, your thoughts, live and in real time. Give me the full cake in the face uh, on this issue. Slice it and dice it any way you like. Uh, send them along by email. Uh, GBviews at gbnews.uk or via Twitter at gbnews. All that coming up after the news with Polly Middlehurst. Mark, thank you. The top story. The Chancellor has paid his fine for breaching lockdown rules after the Prime Minister and his wife also paid theirs and offered a full apology. Police say the fixed penalty notices to Mr and Mrs Johnson relate to a gathering in the Cabinet Room at Number 10 on the Prime Minister's birthday in June 2020. Boris Johnson says he won't resign over the allegations. I want to be able to get on and deliver a the mandate that I have, but also to tackle the problems that the country uh, must face right now and to make sure that we get on with delivering for the people of this country. That is, that is my priority. Boris Johnson. Well, the Labour leader, Sir Keir Starmer, says it's a slap in the face for those who obeyed the rules. 
Relatives they didn't see, funerals they didn't go to, weddings they didn't go to, even the birth of their own children. But the guilty men are the Prime Minister and the Chancellor. They've dishonoured all of that sacrifice. They've dishonoured their office. Never in our history has a Prime Minister been found to have broken the law. And then he lied to the public about it. Keir Starmer. In the United States, the mayor of New York is asking the public to help in the hunt for a gunman who threw a smoke bomb down and then opened fire in a crowded subway carriage, injuring 16 people and a warning the following television pictures may be upsetting if you're watching on TV. Officials say 10 people were shot in the incident, which happened during the morning commute at 36th Street Station in Sunset Park in Brooklyn, New York. The whereabouts of the perpetrator, said to be a black male, is unclear. Police say it's not currently being treated as a terror-related incident and the motive is unclear. The governor of New York says gun violence must end. We say no more. No more mass shootings. No more disrupting lives. No more creating heartbreak for people just trying to live their lives as normal New Yorkers. It has to end and it ends now. Here in the UK, three victims of grooming gangs in Rochdale have received substantial damages and an apology from Greater Manchester Police. Chief Constable Stephen Watson apologised for failings when the women were raped and abused by gangs of men as children. Police failed to record crimes, investigate offenders, collect intelligence or charge and prosecute abusers. It happened under a previous chief constable, including Sir Peter Fahey and his predecessor. On TV, online and on your radio via DAB Plus, you with GB News. Now more from Mark Stein. If you ever get invited to 10 Downing Street, perhaps to one of the many nightly knees-ups, uh, and you ascend that famous staircase with its portraits of all the prime ministers in the nation's history, uh, you might find it hard to remember what all these fellows are actually famous for as they go dancing by. Lord North, the Earl of Liverpool, Mr Gladstone, the Marquess of Salisbury, but the spot at the top of the stairs where the portrait of the present occupant will one day hang, will have a unique distinction. Boris Johnson is the first serving Prime Minister to have been found guilty of breaking the law and to have been sanctioned for it. Uh, it's been a hell of a ride uh, with this guy, more than most high-wire acts in politics. He's been up, down, over, over in Ukraine for the weekend, sauntering the boulevards of Kiev, as if it's a Cotswold village with an insouciance, a sang-froid uh, that was undoubtedly, uh, undeniably impressive. Uh, Im genuinely impressive, I would say. So he's been up, down, over, but is he out? We're going to get to the politics of it, which boils down to, uh, as many wags have observed on their Twitter and Instagram feeds today, a choice between a party led by a man who doesn't know what a woman is and a party led by a man who doesn't know what a party is. As I said, we're going to get to that in a moment. But first, uh, Palm Sandu is with us. Palm is uh, former chief superintendent at Scotland Yard and author of a tremendous book, by the way, Black and uh, Blue. And we are always, uh, Palm didn't believe I'd actually uh, read this book, so uh, I, th I thought I'd produce my <laughs> copy just to convince her. Uh, we're always glad to see Pub. Uh, can we just get, just clarify, if you will, uh, the status of uh, the Prime Minister? He's been slapped with a fixed penalty notice. Is that actually the same uh, as a criminal conviction? Uh, because if it is, that would be rather serious, wouldn't it? Um, first of all, thank you for inviting me on the show tonight. Um, although he's mm. got a fine and it is for criminal mm. behaviour, um, the Prime Minister doesn't have to disclose that when he's applying for new jobs, should he apply for new jobs. So it is slightly different, mm. but had he contested it and said, I'm not going to pay it and it's, uh, you know, I want to go to court, then it would have been a different matter, then he would have got a proper full criminal conviction. So there is a slight difference. 
But in relation to the actual fine, where he's paid it, that should really now be the end of the matter because it is now the same with um, Mr Sunak and also Mrs Johnson as well. So that should be the end of the matter. But what I would say is that the police would not have issued these fines unless the evidence was so strong that they knew they were going to find, uh, that they were going to win it at court. And that's the only reason why they would issue the fines, knowing that they could prove them. So that's a very interesting point, Palm, because you're saying on the one hand, uh, the, the Met would not have issued these fines because this is two years ago. It's right at the beginning of this COVID regime. They wouldn't have issued the fines unless the evidence was overwhelming. And we all assume that uh, Johnson and Sunak and Mrs. Johnson all took the decision not to appeal uh, these this fine on the politics that it would just have dragged it out they'd have got a court date they'd have gone into court but you're actually suggesting that there was there was much greater peril for the Johnsons and Sunak in that if they'd been if if a judge sitting in a courtroom had upheld this thing then we would have a criminal a proper criminal conviction on them and that's that's as likely to be why they didn't do it as the politics First of all, Mark, there's no right of appeal. So when you get a ticket for one of these COVID breaches, you mm. can't appeal it. The only, um, there's only two no. options. One is to pay it, and the mm. second one is to go to court and say that you're not guilty. So there is no right of appeal. So had they gone to court, that would have meant that the other 30 people who were at that party or that gathering, whatever you want to call it, they would have, they mm. potentially could have been called to say, well, what did you see? Did you see the cake? Was there Prosecco? Was there a suitcase full of booze? Mm. It would have opened up mm. the whole fiasco all over again. And as you say, it is two years ago. Um, and we've had the suitcase mm. saga. We've had the, you know, is it a party? Bring your own booze. We've had the cakes. We've had the, you know, was it a work meeting? Was it cheese and wine? So all of that would have come into that arena. In addition, we don't know if this is the only fine that they're going to get because the Met Police are investigating 12 different gatherings. So this is only one that's been right. dealt with so far. There could be more. And Sue Gray was actually looking at 16. And also mm. a reminder for, you, for your listeners and your viewers is that the Met Police were not going to investigate until Sue Gray presented them with 500 pieces of paper and 300 photographs and that's when the Met Police then decided to investigate this. You you mentioned these 30 people who are at the party. As far as we're aware it's only the Prime Minister and his wife and the Chancellor of the Exchequer and uh, do we know whether everyone just gets fined or is it only Ministers of the Crown? No, it should be. Uh, the, the reaction and the treatment that people get should be the same, irrespective of who you are or what rank you hold or what position you hold in the mm. country. So the other 30 people, if they were at that party, they would have been given fines unless they were sat at their de desk observing what was going on around them um, and have completely mm. managed to you know, backpedal out of it, they, I would have expected the whole group right. to have got some sort of a fine. But as, as you've said, uh, there are other incidents. And my sense of this is that th this thing isn't over uh, and, and that they, they will be perhaps imposing additional fines for additional events as the months go by. Um, the, my understanding is that for your first offence, so what would have happened on this occasion, there would have been a £200 mm. fine. And if you pay it within 14 days, mm. you, you pay £100. But then if you get a second mm. fine, it doubles to £400. So potentially this could go mm. into many thousands of pounds, depending on how many different gatherings individuals were at. And if you're one of the organisers, mm. it can be you know thousands of pounds. It can, I think it's £10,000 for organising it. So the amounts will get larger and larger. It just depends on how much proof there is that individuals were at more than one of these functions. Because 
you know, we've all, we've all read the reports that there were many, many functions. So it's just a question of working out mm. who was at those and how many people are going to get multiple fines. And with that, the increase in fines as well. Let me ask you this um, with, with your uh, police hat on. Uh, there's additional events and all the rest of it. And I understand, obviously, this is in a certain sense a political investigation. But if anybody else was accused of, say, holding seven parties uh, in the Shetland Islands uh, or wherever, um, would they be fined party by party or would the investigating officers look into the uh, seven different accusations and issue them one big fine when they were done? Each, um, each party or gathering has to be investigated separately because they're se separate breaches. So it's like if you got parking tickets, you wouldn't lump in seven different times that you were either speeding or did a right to a, a U-turn or a right mm -hmm. turn or something. Each one would be a separate date um, event and the circumstances would have been different. So you can't lump them all together. So each one would be separate, separately investigated, whether you're in the Shetlands, and I love some of your fantasies. You know, we've had the suitcases floating down the Thames with evidence in them and rainbows and things. Well, um, so if you are in the Shetlands and hmm. are there any ponies around and things, um, yes, you, oh, it would be, it would be investigated in the same way, but the Met wouldn't be involved. <laughs> There are people having parties in the Shetlands pub. You shouldn't dismiss it out of hand. We need to, we need to get some drones over outlawing islands and we'll see all the partying going on. So you're satisfied then, just, 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 you're satisfied that this is a, f granted that he's the prime minister and the other guy's the chancellor, this is a fairly normal conduct of the investigation. I believe it is. The only differences have been where the politics have been um, at the front of what's happened was the reluctance, where there was that, I think it was about seven or eight weeks where the commissioner did not want to investigate. And she said, we do not investigate retrospective events. Um, it has to be, yeah. uh, you know, no ambiguity. And there was that little bit of a, a delay there. And in relation to the yeah. fines being issued now, I'm sure that it's not a junior member of the team who is issuing those fines and giving that authority. That would go right to the top to make sure that the case is done properly. So I can't see um, the temporary commissioner now not knowing about who's going yeah. to get these fines because it is, you know, you would not want to be that person knocking on the Prime Minister's door saying, here you go, here's your sheet of paper, can you pay this please? You wouldn't yeah. want to be that. And if, if that wasn't 100%, you absolutely would not want to be part of that organisation. Well, as you said, uh, it's now an acting commissioner because the commissioner who began this investigation uh, has now become uh, retrospective, as you put it, herself. Thank you very much, Palm. We always uh, appreciate nailing down all the fine print on these things, particularly when we're dealing with something as unique as this. As I said, we go back a long way to Sir Robert Walpole and uh, no one, uh, I don't know what taste he had in cakes, but he uh, was uh, never fined for his taste in cakes. Let me know what you think. GB Views at GB News or UK. You can Twitter me at GB News. This story is salience. Uh, only because of the restraints these uh, convicted cake eaters imposed on the uncaked masses from Bognor to Belfast. Toby Young is the founder of the Daily Skeptic website and of the Free Speech Union. He's known Boris Johnson since Oxford and he had a terrific tweet uh, just an hour or so ago. If you're a lockdown skeptic, Boris's fine for breaking lockdown laws is the strongest reason to keep him in office. Why? Because it makes him Polit it makes it politically impossible for him to impose another lockdown. Uh, Toby Young joins us now. Uh, that actually has a ruthless logic to him, to it, because your issue all along has been that these laws were unnecessary. Um, uh, Boris Johnson's cavorting and frolicking uh, actually makes the point that he didn't think they were necessary. Sunak didn't think they were unnecessary. Mrs. Johnson didn't think they were necessary. Uh, and that's really the issue here for you, isn't it? Yes, I think um, 
you know, I've been a lockdown skeptic all along. And um, I think the mm. evidence now that lockdowns um, uh, 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 do far more harm than good is pretty overwhelming. Um, there was recently, uh, mm. just today, uh, or a couple of days ago anyway, a report from the uh, National Bureau of Economic Research, which looked at the impact uh, of lockdowns across every US state. Um, and they looked at the impact mm. on COVID mortality, on education and on the economy. And they produced a composite score for each state and ranked them from one to 50. And the states which did the best, uh, not surprisingly, in the top 10 are states like Florida, Utah, Nebraska, New Hampshire. Um, the states that did the worst, mm. according to this composite score, um, are California, New York, New Jersey, uh, the District of Columbia, Illinois. Um, uh, and, and one of the things that these researchers found, and they included the, a professor of economics from the University of Chicago, uh, was that there was really no relationship between the severity of lockdown measures, the length of lockdowns imposed, and COVID mortality. Um, there's no signal in that noise, mm. either positive or negative. Um, the number of COVID deaths per 100,000 were about the same in California as they were in Florida, yeah. even though California had one of the most severe yeah. lockdowns in the United States and Florida, one of the least severe. So it's pretty clear that lockdowns um, are <laughs> exact appalling costs, economic costs, costs in terms of mental health, costs in terms of lost days in school by children, um, and have no no impact, no discernible impact on reducing COVID mortality. But that's a message that the politicians are very reluctant to absorb. Uh, they don't want to admit that they made a mistake. They don't want to be punished at forthcoming elections because they made this dreadful, catastrophic error. Um, uh, but but so, yeah. so we have to look for other ways to try and restrain them. And I think in this, th this is actually a great way of restraining Boris. I mean, you know, uh, to give him his due, he did lift all restrictions on Freedom Day last July. Yep. He came under enormous mm. pressure to reimpose them over Christmas and resisted. And he now has, you know, uh, announced that, that, that he's embracing this living with COVID strategy. But he, uh, the other day he did say, I'm not going to rule out, you know, uh, imposing another lockdown. Well, I think now he has to rule it out because it would just be politically impossible for him to again ask yep. the population of Britain to observe laws that he himself, the police have concluded, broke. Uh, that would be politically impossible for him to do. And I think that's a reason for keeping him in office. If he was replaced by Jeremy Hunt, even Michael Gove, you know, the mm. drumbeat for another lockdown mm. is now um, uh, becoming quite deafening from all the usual suspects, Independent Sage, NHS Panjandrum, the NHS Confederation, and so on and so mm. forth. Someone like Jeremy Hunt or Michael Gove would have us all locked down again tomorrow. Boris can't do that because oh, it would no. just be politically impossible. Yeah. Well, why doesn't he go full lock, lockdown uh, repentant then and announce uh, and say, yeah, yeah, I shouldn't have had the party uh, and I've paid my fine, uh, but I think actually we should return all the fines we took from ordinary citizens who were fined for sitting on a park bench too long, uh, who were fined for having two people round to their house to sit in the garden. Why All that was rubbish. There's no science behind it. Why doesn't he just uh, announce, uh, I was wrong, I've had my uh, Damascus moment, and I'm going to order the police authorities to refund all that? Well, good point, Mark. We've been promoting a petition on the dailyskeptic.org mm. suggesting exactly that, that the fines should all be mm. returned to the people that were made to pay them, and all ongoing cases against people who breached COVID restrictions should be dropped. Um, uh, but um, I, I, don't, I don't imagine that that is the um, position Boris Johnson will adopt. Um, I think it would be um, uh, too much of a humiliation uh, for him to say, actually, I just got this wrong. Um, it was wrong to lock down. I should have stuck to my gun, stuck to my uh, more libertarian instincts, resisted the overwhelming pressure, uh, uh, you know, and, and, and acknowledge now that uh, the cure was far worse than the disease. Um, the lost days of school, the economic hardship, the closure of high street businesses, all of that was completely unnecessary. I think it'd be politically very difficult, difficult for him to admit all that now. Um, so the best we can hope for, I think, is that he, he effectively um, is, has his hands tied and cannot ever again, at least under you know, his premiership, I I impose another lockdown. Well, I, I think we ought to demand a little more of him because you, you, your, your tweet makes the most basic point, which is that 
Joe Biden or Emmanuel Macron or Jacinda Trudeau or any of the rest of them are not in a position to be able to say, we screwed you over for the last two years. It was a huge mistake to do so. And we're not and when and we're not going to we apologize for it and we're not going to do it again. Be but but Boris is actually in a position to do this precisely because he is a lockdown sinner. He's been found to have been eating cake and uh, convorting, uh, cavorting and gallivanting. And we were ordered to be in a gallivanting free zone for two years. So he's actually he's actually in a better position to do this if he was thinking strategically than Joe Biden, uh, Trudeau, uh, Arden or any of the others. They can't back down off this thing. He can surely now. Yes, but um, I think it, unfortunately, um, uh, even if that would be in his long-term strategic interests, mm -hmm. and I do think that people who don't apologize for the uh, colossal mm -hmm. policy mistake will be punished um, uh, at the next uh, mm -hmm. elections when they face re-election. Um, so you're, you might be right about that, but having known Boris now for uh, the best part of 40 years <laughs> on and off, I can tell you that um, mm. uh, admitting past mistakes and um, uh, 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 meaningfully apologizing for them is not really in his nature. <laughs> no, uh, no. Tell, but tell me about it, uh, Toby. That's uh, that. That's very true. What it has the song go? Someone left his cake out in the rain. Uh, someone left his cake out, and uh, he's worried it will end his reign. But that's ba he. He thinks of his position so he thinks i'll ride it out but he, he's not thinking of any larger service he might perform to the country on this yes i mean um uh, i think it was um one of his uh, teachers at eton who said that boris's problem was that he didn't think uh, the rules applied to him and um subsequently mm. i think he he said kind of echoing this comment that his policy on cake was having it and eating it. And I think that's still his policy <laughs> on cake and almost everything else. But I think he's going to have to amend that now to say, my policy on cake is having it, eating it, and if necessary, paying the fine. Yeah. <laughs> That's, that's right. But you do. You make a fascinating point. If you don't want lockdown back, this is this is the prime minister to keep in office. Thank you very much, uh, Toby Young. Do check out the Daily Skeptic. I do every morning, and I always find something in there that is well worth my time. Up next, your take on the cake. Plus, uh, Natalie Winters and Leilani Dowding. Uh, all coming up. All straight ahead. Don't go anywhere. Hello, I'm Michelle Jubri, and you can join me every weekday, 6 till 7, on Jubes and Kerr. Me and my panel will get stuck right into the day's events. And I can tell you, in fact, I can warn you, expect some robust debates, some strong opinions and perspectives from both sides of the fence. It's about you at home as well. I love to read out all of your comments, or at least as many as I can. So join me, Michelle Jubri, Monday to Friday, 6 till 7, on Jubes and Kerr. On radio, they call it the drive time slot, 4 p.m. until 6 p.m. as listeners head home. It's that part of the schedule when the dust of the day's events begin to clarify, and we try to make sense of it for you. Brazier is drive time for radio and TV. It's fast, it's punchy, it's opinionated, there's a brazier angle and a little bit of levity. That's the question. That's two questions, actually. <laughs> That's Brazier, Monday to Thursday, 4 till 6 on GB News. Hello, I'm Patrick Christie's. And I'm Mercy Moroki. Make sure that you join us Monday to Thursday, 10 a.m. until midday, right here on GB News for To The Point. We're not afraid to talk about the topics that matter to you or the big topics that always matter. We cover absolutely everything from the breaking political stories of the day to law and order, what's going on in the channel. We're not afraid to hold people to account. We always make sure we include your views on our show. Indeed, if you're thinking it, you can guarantee that we're saying it. So make sure you join the conversation with us 10 a.m. until midday, Monday to Thursday, for To The Point on GB News. I'm Dan Wilson. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. 
And I guarantee you, no spin, no bias, no censorship, and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wharton tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Breaking news, uh, the Chancellor of the Exchequer, that American chappy we've been uh, talking about, uh, he's uh, now issued an apology, not for being an American, uh, but uh, for uh, the cake uh, business. Uh, he does have a U.S. green card, does Mr. Sunak. Uh, that entitles you to uh, 25p off every cake. Let's get to your reaction. Uh, we wanted to know what's more important to you, a leader who knows what a woman is, or a leader who knows what a party is. Danny tweets, a leader who knows what the truth is. Good luck with that. Catherine says, why not both? Uh, yeah, because uh, if you know what a woman is, then uh, going to a party is a good way to find one. It's become, you can't do that though, Catherine. It's become part of the partisan divide in our increasingly bitter politics. I don't know if there's any party leader who knows both what a woman is and what a party is. Do Sinn Féin? I don't know. Uh, what, what are the, what's the Shinners' position on what a woman is and what a leader is? We're going to look into that and get uh, back to you. Uh, a Twitter user says, it's apparently it's all down to Kate, but I can't make any decision until I know what flavour it is. Yeah, what kind of Kate was this? Was it a Victoria sponge? Or was it a uh, Queen Elizabeth uh, gateau, which they love in, in, in uh, French Canada? And they're not fans of the monarchy, but they love Queen Elizabeth cake. Very strange. Uh, cake gate only matters because of the COVID, as we were talking about with uh, Toby Young just now. The behavior of Boris Johnson uh, and his fellow cakey faces uh, tells us that they knew the regime they were imposing on the rest of us was rubbish all along. Well, that's bad, but as we've talked about, the entire COVID world is a blizzard of lies. Right back to the original lie, the origin of the virus, which we should have nailed down by now. This is the first global pandemic of the modern era where the origin of the virus has not been confirmed. If you watch this show, you'll know that Viscount Ridley and others have said right here that the preponderance of the evidence favors the lab leak theory. But on social media, on Wikipedia, that still denounced as a conspiracy theory and has been ever since more than two dozen big shot virologists wrote poo-pooing any possibility of a lab leak to the once respected British medical journal, The Lancet. Uh, the very first name on that list of big shots at uh, The Lancet was a professor called Charles Talisher. Uh, there he is just, uh, just below the headline up at uh, top left. The very first name on this list of bigwigs now turns out to have been telling his chums something different in private from what he was saying in public. The lady who broke that story, as she breaks many others, is Natalie Winters of the National Pulse, and uh, we're always happy to see her. Uh, Natalie, th this, again, this gets right back. The, we, we were circling around February and March 2020 forever and ever because all the people who uh, acted then turned out to be basically telling brazen lies, including this guy who signed off on that uh, letter to The Lancet. Well, COVID-19 is without a doubt the Chinese Communist Party's biological weapon of mass destruction. But I think almost equally dangerous are really these weapons of mass distraction and disinformation that you see epitomized by the likes of Charles Kalisher. And of course, really every other signatory on that infamous Lancet statement, the same statement that was used to not only bully programs and hosts like yourself who dared to actually ask the questions mm -hmm. about where COVID-19 came from, uh, but to really, I think, kind of generate a group think among the mainstream media class, especially in the United States, uh, belittling anyone who mm -hmm. wanted to actually ask the questions and get to the bottom of the origins of COVID-19. And of course, there's another name on that statement, uh, Peter Doshak, someone who ultimately had to admit yep. his several conflicts of interest with the Wuhan Institute of Virology. Um, but I really just think it goes to show 
whether it's you, whether you're talking about people in the mainstream media or people who are part of the scientific community that isn't based on truth or facts or evidence, but based on where they're getting their funding from, who's funding their research, where their allegiances lie, uh, what you're hearing from them, the public statements that they, you know, do s just so dramatically, uh, it's mm. not the truth because in private, they're admitting that there's no way we could have definitively concluded that COVID-19 didn't escape from the Wuhan lab. Well, Peter Daszak, who's lavishly, he runs this thing called Eco Health Alliance. He's actually a British subject, but he's uh, lavishly funded by the United States government. And uh, they were using him as the kind of middleman, as the cutout for all this gain of research, uh, uh, gain of function research at Wuhan. So he shouldn't even have been organizing that letter to the Lancet because he's hopelessly uh, corrupted. He's, he's on both sides of this thing. You know, we, we have deferred to authority these last two years um, because we think the Lancet, oh, well, it's been around 200 years. It's, it's a peer-reviewed journal. But in fact, China has, and all kinds of other parties have successfully corrupted the peer review process. Uh, and yet people are, uh, still just want to defer to authority because it's the easiest thing to do. Well, the Chinese Communist Party's modus operandi, whether it's academia, media, uh, even politicians is to buy comp mm. to buy favor to compromise individuals so be very naive mm. to assume that they're not doing the same thing with a lot of these high profile scientists and i think peter doshak who has actually received millions in grants not just from anthony fauci but also from the chinese government itself he's co-hosted conferences sponsored and paid for by ardently uh, Chinese Communist Party run scientific organizations is a perfect example of this. And it should come as no surprise that he was tapped by the World Health Organization to serve as one of the leading COVID-19 investigators. There was also some breaking news just last week uh, that former staffers from inside EcoHealth Alliance, the nonprofit group that he still serves as president of, uh, actually believe that it was the Chinese mm. Communist Party who nominated him for that role, which given the capacity that he served in, again, downplaying uh, anybody who, who was supporting the lab leak theory or even wanted to actually question uh, the favored natural origins theory really comes as no surprise that this would be the case because it really seems that the Chinese Communist Party has gotten their ultimate dream in terms of, you know, it's like getting to pick their own lineup um, on a basketball team. Uh, but for all these voices that the mainstream mm. media and all these international organizations love to cite uh, to really lend credence to the natural origins theory, when in reality, the Wuhan Institute of Virology itself, as we've documented extensively at the National Pulse, has been erasing web page after web page that documents not only their military ties, but the type of gain of function research that they were t participating in, how they were specifically finding viruses, specifically SARS coronaviruses found in bats that could, that were capable of direct human infection. And that's a direct quote from the website, mm. from a web page that's no longer available. So you really can find the crime, I think, in the cover up when it comes to the Wuhan Institute of Virology. It's very bizarre to live in a world where people, though, uh, don't want to know the truth about it. I find it very hard to understand someone who's, uh, you know, willing to mask his kids uh, until they graduate high school. Uh, but at the same time has no curiosity about how this thing actually got going. Uh, and and you, since you brought up the World Health Organization, the WHO, which I think we all understand is basically, uh, we, we pay for it, the West pays for it, but China runs it essentially. And, uh, and yet it looks as if the WHO may emerge from this thing with even more power over sovereign states. Well, that's the funniest thing about COVID-19 is that you think that the, the virus itself would have really been a death knell for all of these people who repeatedly insist that we need more scientific collaboration with China, with mm. any regime. Frankly, mm. even Ukraine, that story broke just a few weeks ago. But I think we've seen yeah. time and time again, like you said, how many years are we into this pandemic? We still don't really know anything about the true origins of the virus. But it's a perfect example how despite the millions, tens of millions of U.S. taxpayer dollars that we shipped overseas, to these Chinese Communist Party run labs, we've been given absolutely no transparency, no insight into where the virus came from. 
And the same goes with the World Health Organization. They only seem to, to be doubling down, trying to demand and, and really stipulate what vaccine policies should be uh, for every country. But it, it's beyond me why these scientists who ostensibly have children are so willing to just accept the mask mandates, the lockdowns, really just giving away any sense of their freedom and liberty um, to peddle the Chinese Communist Party's line. But I think when you understand the way that the Chinese Communist Party works, the millions of dollars that they, and frankly, billions that they use for political warfare mm. to compromise the elites of the top of society, it's a trickle down effect and these people fall in line and they parrot the lines um, really of the American elite ruling class, which I think anyone who's looking around right now, uh, all the way to 1600 mm. Pennsylvania Avenue, even without Hunter Biden's hard drive, you can see are truly bought and paid for by the Chinese Communist Party. In, in a strange way, though, you expect them to buy up powerful politicians. It's slightly weird that just a bunch of rinky-dink, no-name specialists in a field like virology are so prepared to sign on to an obvious act of propaganda, which is what uh, Peter Daszak's uh, round-robin letter to The Lancet was. Uh, we always appreciate hearing what you have to say about these things, uh, Natalie. Great work. You can read Natalie's work in The National Pulse, and you will read stories there that, for some reason, the big daily newspapers don't want to talk about. Uh, and we need the truth about what has been done to the world these last two years, uh, because that's the only way to stop it happening again. Stump the Steins coming up. Ask me anything. GB Views at GBNews.uk. Oh, I'm the one and only Leilani Dowding. That's next. Don't touch that dial. Hello, I'm Michelle Jubri, and you can join me every weekday, 6 till 7 on Jubes and Kerr. Me and my panel will get stuck right into the day's events. And I can tell you, in fact, I can warn you, expect some robust debates some strong opinions and perspectives from both sides of the fence. It's about you at home as well. I love to read out all of your comments, or at least as many as I can. So join me, Michelle Jubri, Monday to Friday, 6 till 7 on Jubes and Kerr. On radio, they call it the drive time slot, 4 p.m. until 6 p.m. as listeners head home. It's that part of the schedule when the dust of the day's events begin to clarify, and we try to make sense of it for you. Brazier is drive time for radio and TV. It's fast, it's punchy, it's opinionated, there's a brazier angle and a little bit of levity. That's the question. That's two questions, actually. <laughs> That's Brazier, Monday to Thursday, 4 till 6 on GB News. Hello, I'm Patrick Christie's. And I'm Mercy Moroki. Make sure that you join us Monday to Thursday, 10 a.m. until midday, right here on GB News for To The Point. We're not afraid to talk about the topics that matter to you or the big topics that always matter. We cover absolutely everything from the breaking political stories of the day to law and order, what's going on in the channel. We're not afraid to hold people to account. We always make sure we include your views on our show. Indeed, if you're thinking it, you can guarantee that we're saying it. So make sure you join the conversation with us 10 a.m. until midday, Monday to Thursday, for To The Point on GB News. I'm Dan Wilson. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wilson tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Coming up on Dan Wooten tonight, as the left-wing media and political establishment goes mad as Boris Johnson, his wife Carrie and Rishi Sunak are all hit with partygate fines, we'll analyse what it means for the future of this government with political heavyweights and expert commentators. Plus, should lockdowns really remain on the table, positive professor Carol Sakura weighs in. And I'll debate the top stories of the day with my superstar panel. Former Daily Star editor and current columnist Dawn Neeson, conservative commentator Calvin Robinson, and entrepreneur and author Angelica Mallon. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursday from 9 p.m. till 11 p.m. on GB News.
Ladies and gentlemen, the Academy Award-winning best song of 1937. Sweet Leilani, Sweet Leilani Heavenly Flower Tropic skies are jealous as they shine. As they shine. Lovely. Bing Crosby in the film Waikiki Wedding. It was like the X-Men uh, 12 of its day. Bing had his sweet Leilani up on the big screen. But for those of us who have to labor in the humdrum real world, there was a definite dearth of Leilani's until my next guest came along. She's the only Leilani in the history of the Balkans ever to set foot in Bosnia and Kosovo. Maybe they, uh, they wouldn't have turned out the way history uh, led them to go if they'd had more Leilani's on the ground. She was there to boost the morale of British troops. She set her own reality TV show, her own clothing line. Uh, she was a celebrated page three girl back in the long lost days when even Keir Starmer knew what a woman was. It's a pleasure to welcome Leilani Dowding. Leilani, before we uh, get to all the other stuff, uh, you, were, you, you were the subject of a, a fairly vigorous uh, attempt to get you bounced from Instagram just, just the other day. What, what had you done to merit this attempt to cancel you? Well, I actually was banned from Twitter. I, I, I'm sorry, Instagram. I'm completely banned. Um, I've got a 30-day uh, Facebook ban right now at the moment. And I have been trying, yeah. they've tried to kick me off Twitter as well. So I got reported on Twitter the other day for posting a picture saying it's very weird of um, Zelensky being posing around and doing all his photo shoots. So there was that. Um, oh, I got yeah. a 30-day ban on uh, Facebook for questioning why it's taxpayers' money that's going to go and pay the vaccine um, damages, rather than the big pharma companies who have made billions and billions out of this vaccine. Why are our government, mm. with our money, paying for vaccine damages? Um, and then I got another Facebook ban for questioning why there's a $53 million lawsuit against a horse vaccine, not even a human vaccine. So it's like, I can't speak about vaccines at all. Um, and Instagram, I got wiped off for being against lockdowns and mandates. As well, oh, it's very about so. <laughs> yeah, so j just to just to go, so the mandate thing is, you've got uh, taxpayers of no choice about whether they have to take these things or not. Uh, uh, but if it kills somebody, then the taxpayer also has to pay. To compensate the person who is getting, you've become. Do, do you feel you've become controversial, or are you slightly surprised that things you say uh, rile people enough uh, to want to get you expunged from public life entirely? I am surprised because I think it's pretty normal to ask questions. Why can't we ask questions? That's all mm. I do. Why is Zelensky posing and taking photo shoots all the time? Mm. Why can't we talk about vaccine safety and vaccine efficacy? Why, uh, mm. why were we locked down? You know, all of these questions, they should not be controversial. Why, why are women, um, sorry, why are biological males in women's sports? I don't think there's um, they're, they're stupid questions to be asking. Well, let me let me just pick that one up, Leilani, because uh, it seems almost ludicrous now that if you ask people outside the House of Commons what a woman is, as a, a GB News reporter did the other day, they all flee uh, in terror. At the Australian Ministry of Health, they're unable to say what a woman is. On the U.S. Supreme Court, the newest judge can't say what a woman is. Um, are you sort of surprised that uh, what a woman is has apparently become a political hot potato? It's completely insane. It's an adult female human. Every biological male, even if they're claiming to be a woman, has male DNA, um, male chromosomes through every single cell of their body. So mm. a female... Uh, a female, a woman, is an adult human female. And why can't Keir Starmer, Richie Sunak and all the rest of them say that? 
Well, because uh, there's this possibility... Well, as Keir Starmer, he, he dodged the one about whether a woman can have a... Pee I mean, I take the chromosome thing, which is very interesting to me, but in the old days with transsexuals, as we said then, they at least had to go and have the old wedding tackle taken off, and they went through a lot of trouble to pass no, as a woman, which was the... Hmm. Now they just have to identify. Yeah, they, they just do, have they... to say, I feel that I am a female. Um, look at Leah Thomas. Look at the size of her. Um, mm. Her, I say her because mm. I'm trying. I'm being politically correct here. But look at him. Yeah. Look at the size of him compared to the other females. Like this is not fair. It's a completely unfair um, advantage that he has. He should not be playing uh, women's sports. Um, they shouldn't be in women's hospital, in women's hostels, in um, women's jails, in our changing rooms. It's completely and utterly wrong. And I think there's a lot of nervousness. Like politicians are afraid to say it. I think the majority of people know and they can define it. But I think the problem is, is they're too afraid of the backlash. They're too afraid of um, what's happened to um, J.K. Rowling, for example. You can't... Yeah, yeah. Even you know, no one cares how somebody wants to live. I don't care if a man wants to put a dress on and, and say he's a woman and, and I identify. But me not wanting them to be in women's sports or, or what I've described it does not make me a transphobe, which is this new word that's going around, calling everybody a transphobe mm. if they don't agree with them, you know, being in, in what we fought for, our own sports, our own awards, our... Um, our own hostels. Well, it's, uh, in sport, it's certainly uh, offend. If it's not fair, it's not sport. And even these over-remunerated, uh, frankly evil American college coaches doing anything to win, like putting a guy on the team, uh, should understand that it's not a real win because it wasn't fair. But what I, what I find sort of slightly unnerving about this is that if you compare it to the way it was 30, 40, 50 years ago, there's a sense now that women themselves are kind of being erased by this. The idea of a female identity uh, that is beyond Leah Thomas. It's beyond me suddenly sticking a frock on and saying, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm GB News' new female uh, presenter. If, if anyone can do that, then there's no such thing as a woman. And increasingly, this whole transgender movement seems to be diminishing women in that sense. Yes, absolutely. Um, it's, it's, it is, we, we fought so hard for our rights, only to have a man come along and say, you know what, I can be better at being a woman than you can. I can be better at sport mm. as a woman than you are. I can be, I can win your awards and your business awards, be woman of the year. They, they just had um, the transgender, uh, I think he's the deputy secretary for health in America, who's a transgender, win an award for mm. best female or, or whatever it was that um, he yeah, got Yeah, woman award of the for. year. Woman of the Year. I'm sorry, Woman of the Year. And it is it's completely unfair. Yeah. He's not a woman. He is a biological male. And, you know, we had Tom Harwood just come out and say, look, if a trans person blocks puberty um, of their birth sex, then they can they will grow the, the bone of the sex they want to be with the hormones. So he's basically saying um, it's OK if they want to do sport, let them get hormone blockers mm. at puberty, which is, you know, 12 or 13 years old is puberty. So you're talking about giving hormone blockers to 11 and 12 year old kids. It's completely and utterly crazy. Um, and I say it's crazy, but there's a couple of people out there who think it's normal and it's just not. The, speaking of Instagram, the, I saw like an amazing thing on Well, it was a horrifying thing on Instagram now. Uh, saluting the courage of uh, uh, adolescent girls as they're entering puberty. So these girls are, you know, 14, 15, whatever. Uh, and they've had their breasts removed and they're all sh showing their scars. Uh, and the different and, and they're hailing the courage of these girls 
These girls, if they change their mind, they'll never get those breasts back. And in many cases, they're now going to be infertile. They'll never be able to have children. Why are we encouraging? A bit, and that's slightly different from the damage that is done to boys. The damage to young girls, 11, 12, 13, 14, they're all posing there on, uh, on, on uh, TikTok and uh, whatever with, with, their, with their scars from where their breasts have been removed. This is tragic, isn't it? Leilani? Oh, I think we've lost Leilani. That's uh, Just hold that picture of her, by the way, that pose, because that's a beautiful pose uh, where she's uh, considering uh, what I had to say. Well, uh, OK, we've lost Leilani. That's great, because I always like to hear what she has to say. So we'll have to get her, we'll have to get her back. In our closing moments, then, let's go stumping. Jamie says via GB News, would it be appropriate to have a party when Boris is either sacked or resigned. I can't, I can't believe this. Uh, in fact, I don't think he will be sacked and I don't think he will resign. But, he, he, you know, party is now going to be the word hung around his neck. And I remember from the Spectator days uh, when uh, he was my editor at the Spectator, I never got the impression that Boris even liked parties. Parties, work parties aren't like real parties where you have your, your friends. Around. Oh, pa uh, we've, uh, we've managed to get Leilani back. Uh, I'm, uh, uh, great, Leilani, are you there? Yes, so, oh, have you dropped out again? Oh, <laughs> she can only bear four... Are you still are you still there, Leilani? I was saying this was a tragedy for the girls who have physically mutilated and are now actually showing off photos of their mutilation. Don't you think this is tragic, what we're doing to 12, 13, 14-year-old girls? Absolutely. It's, hor it's absolutely horrific. So I think I saw, I saw um, the former actress, Ellen Page, who now calls herself Elliot mm. Page, the same thing, and she was hailed by the BBC and the Daily Mail as brave, um, as showing off her scars, and it is completely and it's mutilating young girls who already mm. could be a little bit um, insecure about growing breasts, you know, and 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 it, puberty is a rough time for some girls, you know, and things are changing. See, I was such a tomboy when I was little. I hated. Um, Girls clothes, I hated girls toys. Um, I actually had my school start a rugby team because I wanted to play rugby. I boxed. And look, I am such a feminine huh? woman. Um, and that's just how I went it was from probably about the age of maybe six or seven to about 17, 18. Um, I wanted to play with Action mm. Man and Transformers. And uh, <laughs> embarrassingly, I actually tried to pee standing up when I was probably about eight, and not last week or anything, but when I was a child, didn't work out. But oh. you know that's do. But you know something, Leilani, if. If uh, you'd been my little girl and I'd taken you along to the doctor now, and I'd say, oh, my daughter, uh, she likes to pee standing up and she plays with Transformers and she wears boy clothes, they would have put you on puberty uh, blockers and said, oh, well, obviously Leilani will uh, have to change her name to Lionel and she wants to be a boy. So we're going to... That's what's worrying. And, and if, uh, if the parents say, well, I don't know about that, it might just be a phase she's going through then all the doctors and social services say oh well you've got to be uh, have your kid taken away from you because you're transphobic absolutely and that's what's terrifying you know in 20 years ago sorry 40 i'm 43 now 40 years ago 35 years, it was called being a tomboy you know it was just being a tomboy mm. and girls would sometimes you know sort of grow out of it sometimes they would be a little more butch or whatever but it wasn't that you had to change <laughs> identify as a man we're gonna have to we're gonna have to leave it there Leilani thank you I'm so glad they didn't turn you into a boy Dan Wooden is here to titillate your Tuesday as no one else can stay safe stay free hello again I'm Adam McGiven from the Met Office warmer and brighter weather is on the way for the Easter weekend but for the next 24 hours we'll see further outbreaks of rain moving north before clearing showers breaking out elsewhere 
chance at a lot of cloud, particularly overnight. At the moment, low pressure sits to the southwest of the UK. That's been drawing up some warm weather across southern parts of the country, but also bands of rain and it's one band in particular that is going to persist across much of Scotland, Northern Ireland, parts of Northern England overnight, whilst showers continue for Western England as well as Wales. Elsewhere, some clear spells and mostly dry towards the east of England, the far northwest of Scotland. But whether you've got the cloud or the clear spells, it's going to be a frost-free start, a mild start to Wednesday, but a fairly gloomy start. You can see the extent of the cloud, a lot of low cloud, mist and hill as well as coastal fog to wake up to. And it's a slow start really with that cloud continuing until lunchtime in many places. Eventually it lifts and breaks so the skies do brighten up. The rain in the northeast also starts to peel away and away from the northeast where it stays on the cool side temperatures fairly widely up to 15 to 18 celsius with the potential for 22 celsius somewhere around.